Although this program was made in February of 1988, the information contained in it about Jesse Jackson was never brought out in the regular media. The farmers need emergency money for planting new season. Tell Reagan, don't give a hundred million dollars to the country, give it to the country. We sat in negotiations with Fidel Castro, which was uh, Fidel, uh, uh, his, his, um, his, essentially his ambassador to the United States, uh, Ramon Sanchez Parodi, <clears throat> Reverend Jackson and myself, and we sat down in negotiations for seven hours, non-stop negotiations, and it was just phenomenal to me. What's, what's he like as a well, personal human being? Personally, a very complex individual, of course, uh, as one would imagine of someone of his, of his stature and his experience and so on. He is a very funny man, tremendous sense of timing. Uh, I think that probably comes from him being a minister. Uh, and it, I mean, he can just keep us laughing the whole time that we're, that we're on, the, on, on the road and, and has a tremendous facility for mimicking uh, other politicians. And, so who does he do? And, he does Trump Thurman real well. <laughs> <laughs> as we gather today, images workers in Texas have lost their jobs. When oil drops $20 a barrel, more than J.R. Ewing is in trouble. <laughs> And we're not in World War II anymore. Uh, Europe is, is, their borders are secure. They're able to take care of themselves. We spend almost 45% of our defense budget on the defense of Europe alone. Um, and so he begins to see that, you know, there is a real possibility now for a reduction in arms a very real possibility for a reduction in the bloated military, military budget. Now, what does that mean? That means that he, it frees up monies for domestic spending. It frees up monies for helping. We focus on Jesse Jackson. What's he like? What's unique about him? How about his sense of humor? Does he have any chance to win? We talk with the Texas campaign manager for Jackson and see portions of a speech by Jesse. Right now on Alternative Views. February of 1988, we presented information about Jesse Jackson as he was trying to get the Democratic nomination for president. But the information we have contrasts greatly with what you were being told on the establishment media about the man. Hello, welcome to Alternative Views. Today we're going to begin discussing the future of American politics after Reagan and Reaganism. We assume that Ronald Reagan, like all old generals, will eventually just fade away and something new will take his place. So the question is, what's next for American politics after Reaganism? Well, the 1988 election will begin deciding the fate of American politics, and thus we're very happy to have with us today Armando Gutierrez, who is the Texas manager of the Jesse Jackson campaign for presidency. Uh, Armando was a professor at the University of Texas, at Houston University, and at Mississippi State in Jackson, and has been with the Jackson campaign since 1984, and thus is one of the most experienced political operatives as well as a political scientist. So Armando, welcome back to Austin. We're glad to have you with us today. It's good to be back. Though. On Alternative Views. In 1986, Jesse Jackson made a speech to the local P9 workers of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. And we have a copy of that speech and we'll play portions of it this evening on Alternative Views. Usually when struggles grow and develop, there are many ways to make you lose a struggle. One is to take your eyes off of the prize. Enemy likes the virtue of attention, Divide and conquer. 
and had you discussing everything in the dress except the crime. Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches without vision people perish. If we lose our, our vision, we'll lose the struggle. The vision is workers want to work and get paid for their work. Today we're here not fighting for welfare, but fighting for our share. We want to work, but then get paid for the work that we do on the safe and health standards. I urge you, my brothers and my sisters, have courage, but don't use courage as a substitute for one's eyes being on the prize. You must not lose the moral initiative. If the nation focuses on tear gas and police and sheriffs and jails, it does not have very much appeal to anybody. This is about jobs and peace and justice and safe working conditions, it affects everybody. Our challenge today is to maintain the moral high ground. Don't lose your head, for if you do, your body is soon to fall. Maintain your eyes on the prize. Job! When your back is against the wall, don't get trapped focusing on the mailman when the issue is the post office. Let's begin by discussing the most important issues in the 1988 election. What do you think the election's all about? Well, I guess at a, at a kind of a, a broader level, probably what I would see as being the most significant issue is the issue of leadership. Uh, in that, in many ways, what uh, the President of the United States does is really offer a kind of moral, philosophical, uh, and of course political, economic, etc., leadership for the nation. Sets a tone within which American politics operates. And I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a significance that is often overlooked. Uh, I think one of the legacies of the Reagan administration is going to be that he set a tone um, that was really quite negative, a tone that was very, uh, that appealed to some of our baser instincts as human beings. All of us, of course, have fears, insecurities, uh, etc. And one of the things that, that Reagan uh, played to and did it very skillfully um, was to those kinds of fears and prejudice. Fears and prejudice of people who spoke different languages, who came from different backgrounds, uh, people whose, uh, whose uh, sexual preferences were different and so on. <clears throat> and it created an atmosphere in which it was, it, was, it, was almost, it was almost okay to be mean uh, to people who were less fortunate, to people who, who had not had the same kind of, of possibilities in life that others had. And so I think that ultimately uh, becomes a very, very significant issue in this campaign. Who of all the candidates uh, who, are, who are currently running offers the kind of leadership that will give America uh, a new direction? Uh, give America the possibility of looking not only at itself, but indeed looking at the world in a way that is really significantly and fundamentally different from the way in which we have looked at it uh, for some time now, really, but particularly in the last uh, in the last uh, couple of uh, in the last two administrations of uh, of Ronald Reagan. Um, beyond that, I think obviously the the issue that probably most people are really looking at is the issue of the economy. Um, I, I think it's, it's become very clear Reagan was almost able to write out his, his two terms uh, with the idea that you, know, you were better off uh, under Reagan than you were under previous presidents. Uh, and of course about a year or so before, before um, he was able to go out of office, 
uh, the chickens have come, come home to roost. And so, of course, the stock market crash and the Iran-Contra hearings uh, and a whole series of things have demonstrated that uh, not only in terms of the economy, but as far as foreign policy and a variety of other areas, that, uh, you know, again, we were being led in a, in a, in a very, in a very uh, uh, ultimately negative direction and, and ultimately self-destructive regarding the American economy and American people uh, direction. So I think that that becomes a, a particularly important issue, that is to say the overall status of the American economy and who has the kind of vision, the kind of programs um, that can lead us in a direction that will, that will put us back on our feet again uh, financially. How does Jesse Jackson stand out from the others or differentiate from the others in this regard? I think on, on, on you're talking about specifically the economy or you, uh, well, no, the leadership question on, as well. On the leadership, yes. Okay, well, the vision <coughs> that he has. Right. Well, I, I, it, 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 it would almost take uh, two or three or four of these programs, I think, to lay it out. Uh, but fundamentally, I think uh, you're looking at a, at a very, very basically different view, not only at America, but of the world. That is, um, in many instances, many of the candidates still are operating under presumptions, under ideas that were uh, evolved around the Cold War period. Uh, you know, all of us grew up in that period where, you know, the Soviets were expansionist, the Chinese were expansionist, everybody was out to get us. Every time that anybody in the third world sneezed, you know, it was because of uh, some communist conspiracy and so on. Of course, the U.S. was expansionist at the same time, and it was just different superpowers Absolutely. expanding against each other Absolutely. that caused these tensions of the Cold War. No question. And right. my point is right. that I think of all the candidates that are running, only mm -hmm. Jesse, in a, in, in, a, in a very significant way, uh, embodies that alternative view. And, and what it means is not only that we deal with other countries in a different way, but that indeed they view us differently. You know, our experience uh, uh, in, our, in our trips uh, around the world has really been quite phenomenal because uh, I think I can say with confidence that there is no other American um, who could go virtually anywhere in the world uh, including not only the 130 countries that are generally seen as being part of the third world, but even in the, in the developed countries, industrialized countries of the West and the East and so on, and could draw huge audiences from the rank and file population, as well as being able to negotiate and deal with, with leadership. I think Jesse is the only person who can do that. This is an amazing thing about me. I've noticed in following Jesse Jackson in various places over the past uh, several years, he seems to have an incredible ability to negotiate. And he can go into a situation where you think, hey, you're going to lose your life. But he can come out and get the people talking and get some type of agreement. This is an amazing skill. Absolutely, no question. Uh, in now, fact, you saw some of this, I guess, when you went on some of these international trips. With certainly did. I've seen it at an international level as well as, as, as here domestically. I have seen him in several uh, union management confrontations. It, situations where you had had these, these people on strike or you had had uh, you know, some ugly incidents going on for, for, for several years. Uh, and Jesse able to come into that situation and basically sit down with both sides. Or in some instances, they wouldn't even sit down with each other. But he would go and talk with one side, talk a little bit about the, what the issues were and so on, go and talk with management and find out what the, And then see where are the points of vulnerability, the points of, of where there's potential agreement. And then work that out. At the international level, the exact same thing. You know, we sat in negotiations with Fidel Castro which was uh, Fidel, uh, uh, his, his, um, his, essentially his ambassador to the United States, uh, Ramon Sanchez Parodi, <clears throat> Reverend Jackson and myself, and we sat down in negotiations for seven hours, non-stop negotiations, and it was just phenomenal to me. What, to, what were they negotiating about? Well, a whole series of things. Um, we had been told, we, all, of our, all of the foreign trips that we take, we always make it a point of talking with our State Department uh, before we go. Uh, we always make it a point of letting them know exactly what we're doing, where we're going, when we're going to be there, etc. And get, getting briefed on U.S. policy in the area, uh, U.S. interests in the area as defined by the State Department, etc. We did this on this occasion. Uh, we had been told that, uh, that Fidel would not be willing to negotiate a whole series of things. One, the uh, family reunification, uh, the reacceptance of the Mariel uh, boat lift people the um, normalization of relations with the United States, the, uh, the beginning of talks with the United States with no preconditions, um, acceptance of the Contadora process in Central America, uh, and a series of other things. And we sat down and talked those things through. And what we found, of course, was that Fidel was willing to agree to all those things. 
He was willing to, to talk uh, without any preconditions with the United States. He was willing to establish normalized relations with us. Uh, indeed, he said he'd like to. Uh, his argument was, of course, uh, quite logical that um, that many of the goods that they get, whether it's it's medical uh, supplies or whether it's uh, auto parts, etc., have to come all the way from Eastern Europe. And those are the countries that have historically um, have his historically been supportive of of of, of Cuba. Uh, that they would love to do that with the United States. I mean, it's 90 miles away. Key West, Florida is 90 miles away from, from Cuba. That it was, it made all kinds of sense for all kinds of reasons and that they had come to, to um, accept the fact that they lived next to the world's largest superpower. And they didn't understand why we couldn't get used to, uh, as the lar world's largest superpower, why we couldn't get used to living next door to this small, you know, as he put it, relatively insignificant country. So, the, but, but my point is that, is that in those kinds of discussions, there was just a real, you know, hard, um, uh, very uh, upfront kind of dialogue and discussion and give and take, and then coming out of that with with a whole series of, of agreements that uh, that Fidel reached. We did the same thing with, with the with the uh, with the uh, Nicaraguans when we met with them, for example, when we were with the Sandinistas. You know, again, the same thing. What what were those like? Well, same about? thing. They had they had talked about. Uh, we had talked with our State Department. And they had talked about that the the uh, Sandinistas were not willing to have elections. Um, um, that they were going to put them off for, for some time. Uh, they agreed to do that, and of course they, 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 did. they, they, they did it. They did it uh, with mass participation, in fact, mm -hmm. by the people with seven different political parties uh, participating, uh, over 2,000 international observers. Um, they agreed to that. Um, they agreed to, to amnesty for uh, those people who had been involved in, in the resistance movement there, the Contras. Um, again, they agreed to normalize relations with the United States. Uh, and you know, to to, to stop uh, any kind of exportation of, of arms and so on to uh, to other countries, uh, which they said they weren't doing anyway. But uh, in any case, the point is that that in in response to your question is that you know Jesse was able to go into those in, into those situations. And I might add, I should I should add that it wasn't only with Fidel Castro and with with the Sandinistas. It was also, for example, with El Salvador when we met with Duarte and talk to him about his situation. Uh, so it wasn't only like only dealing with people who generally considered to be left or progressive, but even dealing with, you know, with very conservative elements. We met again with Duarte. And as I say, the same thing in the United States where we not only have met with, with union membership, but we've met with management. And again, Jesse having a facility for being able to dialogue with all of those parties and try to get them to, to, to and as he often says, what happens in so many situations, I know I have been involved in, in being involved with, with, with Jesse. We've talked about uh, developing a coalition, for example, between blacks, Hispanics, progressive whites, and so on. I know we've been in several instances where we're, we're in, in, in my own group, in, uh, dealing with Latinos, where, you know, there's a certain resistance to, op to, to, to working with blacks, saying, well, you know, they're getting everything, we're not getting anything, and blah, 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 and he's black, he only cares about... You know, and then sitting down and saying, well, look, let's, let's, let's draw up the ten issues that we think are most important. And then having blacks do the same thing. And then comparing those things and finding that on eight out of the ten issues, we agree. Right. And saying, you know, let's not focus on the two that we disagree on. Let's focus on the eight that we agree on. And after we've worked our way through that, then let's see how, what we can do about the other two. And in many instances, it's simply a question of, a, of, of, of approaching a negotiating situation without a lot of... Of, of stereotypes with a lot, a lot of, of uh, preset notions. I recall recently I was reading the, the book by Bob Woodward, Veil, and it was very interesting because I think one of the more, more significant revelations in that book is where you had uh, people in the Reagan administration who already had a preset uh, idea of what it is that the Soviets were, un were, Soviets were doing, whether it, and, and the Cubans were doing, whether it's in El Salvador or Nicaragua or Grenada or somewhere else, and even those CIA reports would say that we, there's no evidence of that they would refuse to accept it and say, I mean, they would say, keep doing it until you get what we want you to get, which we right. know is going on, right, even though it wasn't going on. And so the point that I'm making is that I think part of the negotiation is, is uh, of the skill of negotiation is going in without a lot of those prejudices, without a lot of those, the assumption that management is wrong, the assumption that uh, union membership is wrong, the assumption that the government is wrong, the assumption that those that are protesting against the government are, are wrong. I mean, you know, you just kind of go in there with, 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 with and, and allow yourself to be kind of neutral as you're approaching that. And it makes a huge difference in terms of, of, of how you, you're able to, uh, to negotiate your way through that. You've seen, you know, travel with Jesse Jackson, know him real well. What's, what's he like? He, he comes across as sincere, funny, 
uh, quick, with a big grasp of the <clears throat> of the issues and all. What's what's he like as a well, personal human being? Personally, a very complex individual, of course, uh, as one would imagine of someone of his of his stature and his experience and so on. He is a very funny man. Tremendous sense yeah. of timing. Uh, I think that probably comes from him being a minister. Uh, and I mean, he can just keep us laughing the whole time that we're that we're on the on on the road, and, and has a tremendous facility for mimicking uh, other politicians. And so who does he do? He does Trump Thurmond real well, and then a lot of black ministers and so on that he's had relationships with over the years. Um, he's really quite good at doing that. But at the same time, he's a very intense man, and amazingly, amazingly insightful. It's been very interesting to me because before I started uh, working as campaign manager here in the state of Texas. Um, I was a p policy advisor uh, and speechwriter for the campaign, <clears throat> and one of my jobs in doing that uh, was to organize briefing sessions for the debates. And as you know, uh, there have been an enormous number of debates around the country uh, before before these elections, and so I would bring in people from you know all over the country and and some high level people uh, in economics, in in foreign policy, on uh, you know arms negotiations, very technical areas, and we would normally have three, four, five people who would come into into the city where the debate was going on. And it never failed to amaze them that they would sit there in some very specific area that they just knew everything about, you know. And they would be able to go through and talk about it for five or ten or fifteen minutes, and immediately he would have a, a, a grasp of it that even they didn't understand. And then he would, of course, the real facility was to take those very complex issues and then put it in some kind of form, whether it's, it, it's in, in kind of a story form or a parable form or, or a one-liner or something, that kind of encapsulated uh, an entire concept, an entire set of ideas. And they were always amazed at, I mean, without, without fault, without the failure, they were always amazed at his ability to grasp these very complex mm -hmm. issues. And then again, be able to put them across to the American public in a form that was much more understandable. Uh, and that's basically the way he operates. As we gather today, images workers in Texas have lost their jobs when oil drops Twenty dollars a barrel. More than J. L. Ewing is in trouble. <laughs> Thousands of workers lose their jobs when energy drops. When energy drops, workers lose their jobs. The oil drillers stop drilling. We become dependent all over again on hostile sources of oil. You can't be a minister talking that well. You know. All the truck, now I can save 25 cents on a gallon of gas. Your freedom is worth more than a quarter. Yeah. Uh, other than uh, at, at the more personal level, this kind of, um, this humorous side of Jesse Jackson, which I guess those people who saw the Saturday Night Live show probably got a, a taste of that. I've seen but speeches where he talked, where he has a good pork chop story, where with five kids and three pork chops. Yeah. In a government-induced crisis, farmers didn't just wake up one day and make a big mistake. We should declare 80,000 family farmers whose land is being repossessed a state of national emergency. We must declare a moratorium on foreclosures and repossession of farms.
We need the farmer. So sure we don't have money to bail the farmer out. If we can buy an airplane and fly from Dallas to Japan in two hours, we need farmers more than we need a two-hour flight to Japan. coming up with those kind of stories and like I said one of the things that is very gratifying about working with him is that is that the stories have substance it's one thing to tell a story because it kind of is catchier because it uh, it you know it, it's an alliteration that that sounds nice and so on but it's another thing to say something that really has some substance to it uh, again uh, the, the one that you make reference to where he talks about a mother with uh, with five children and only having three pork chops I mean really very significant when you stop and think about it particularly us as a nation a nation as blessed as we are and with the resources that we have, that we have so much excess in terms of food and so on, and yet we still have 20 million Americans that are hungry. Um, we have 33 million Americans in poverty. Um, I and mean, that, that kind of thing is just has a lot of substance to it. And there's a Graham Rudman uh, parable about the ham and egg sandwich. Exactly. Uh, talking about how the cuts, while they appear to affect everybody evenly, and of course all of the other candidates supported Graham Rudman, um, that in fact, when you start off with less, those cuts hit you, hit you harder. I mean, that and in the face of this crisis, here have come three millionaires brought the Graham, Rudman, Holland, Hall, Butcher, immoral, mindless legislation. And talk about it's fair. It's not fair. Well, Reverend, it's equal. It's not equal. It reminds me of a ham and egg legislation. I'm a ham and egg sandwich. Say a little fast ham and egg, I can take it. Put on one piece of bread, ham and egg. But you had a chicken in the hall down here, a chicken with a meaty degree with a ham and egg sandwich. Because all the chicken got to do is drop an egg and move on. But the hall for this degree, the hall would have to drop an egg and could not move on. Down with Graham, Rutland, Hollis, and up with John. So the rich people are the chicken and the, the poor people are the pig. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I said those kinds of stories with, with an awful lot yeah. of substance. Armando, let's talk now about the difference between Jesse Jackson and the other Democratic uh, candidates, as well as the difference between his vision and Ronald Reagan. What makes Jesse Jackson's vision of the world that you began talking about different than the other candidates? Well, to begin, I think that um, it really comes as, it, it, it's a much more, um, it's a much, or maybe put it the other way around, it's a much less patronizing, a much more um, uh, mature, uh, I think, vision of the world. That is to say, uh, let, me give, let me give you an example. <clears throat> in, in the last campaign, uh, I was responsible for organizing a meeting uh, with, uh, with the Mexicans. Um, the Secret Service was very much opposed to us going to Mexico to meet with, with, with Mexican leadership to find out, we want to find out about immigration, about, about the, uh, the debt crisis, uh, about uh, the, the, the situation with uh, what was happening with oil prices and so on. <clears throat> you know, Jesse instinctively understood that there was no way that he could invite Mexicans to come to the United States 
to talk about these issues. He understood that from the standpoint of respect and the standpoint of really getting an honest assessment of the situation, it was important that he as an American go to Mexico. That instead of again the, you know, the, the, the boss uh, calling in you know, his, his peons to tell them what he's going to do, uh, that it was important that he go to Mexico, that he show that he respected them, respect their opinion. He was willing to deal with them on their terms, in their turf. I mean, it's very significant from a third world perspective that an awful lot of people, I think, do not <clears throat> fully comprehend. And it was, it was very, it, it in many ways symbolized the difference between Jesse and the way a lot of other candidates deal with things. Because part of our problem in dealing with third world countries is exactly having that vision that, that, you know, that they somehow are dependent on us, that they somehow don't have anything to offer. You know, the, 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 the situation in Central America is a very good case in point, where uh, even back at that time, in, in the 84 campaign, of, of all the candidates who, who were running, um, Jesse was the only one who said, peace in Central America must come from Central America. It must be an indigenous process. And that is why we were supportive of the Contadora process at that time. Um, because again, the idea, but, but from the Reagan perspective, it was, there's no way that they can come up with, I mean, how can they negotiate a peace for Central without us being involved, without the, us telling them, what they, telling them what they need to do? Um, I think that's a very fundamental point that distinguishes Jesse from, from any of the other candidates. And again, it comes from, a, a, from experience and it comes from, from him having dealt with so many people in the world because, of course, he's been all over the world and, and, and not as a tourist, but in talking with folks he went to, to, to the Southern African countries. The same thing. So it's more of an international vision of seeing the world as a totality and to be able to respect and understand the differences exactly. between different countries and, and, and cultures. And, and, and respecting them and accepting them in their own terms rather mm -hmm. than imposing your terms, your, vision. You know, your right. experience, your history, right. your assumptions on them, you know, your visions of where you right. think they should go. Which is very different from the liberal establishment, the core of which is we're going to have these programs to help you, we're right. going and under our terms. Exactly. We're going to paternalist. Uh, yes, we're going to have our, but you have to accept our values. And Absolutely. Do that. Absolutely. It's a very fundamental difference, and it's 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 one that it's amazing to me because because so many people do not see it, and yet it is probably one of the most substantive differences mm -hmm. between Jesse and the other candidates. It also informs some of the other differences, I think, uh, particularly in terms of of the way he approaches domestic policy, because in the first place. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it informs it in the sense that when you begin to develop an alternative view uh, such as this, it also means that you begin to realize that our national defense, for example, should correspond to our national needs, not to our national imagination. Mm. Uh, and what you really have had, particularly in the Reagan administration, is this imagination. I mean, if you believe that ghosts exist, you know, you will take all kinds of measures. You may end up, you know, shooting somebody uh, from your family because you were trying to shoot a ghost. I mean, the, the, the consequences are right. significant, right? Um, and we have had a foreign policy in, in many ways in this country that really corresponds more to our imagination rather than to our real needs. I mean, the world, you know, we're not in World War II anymore. Uh, Europe is, uh, their borders are secure. They're able to take care of themselves. We spend almost 45% of our defense budget on the defense of Europe alone. Um, and so, he begins to see that, you know, there is a real possibility now for a reduction in arms, a very real possibility for a reduction in the bloated military, military budget. Now, what does that mean? That means that he, it frees up monies for domestic spending. It frees up monies for helping third world countries evolve and develop as they need, which helps us too. Mm -hmm. Because when those countries develop and they buy our products, obviously that creates jobs for us as well. Right. I mean, one of the major problems we have right now with the Latin American debt is not only that they can't pay it, but is that they can't buy our products. And therefore, of course, we lose all kinds of jobs to the third world. But in addition to that, he recognizes that, you know, one has to, as a, as, as a sitting president, one has to try and even the playing field. And in an international sense, not just domestically, because in many ways what has happened is you have had, has had uncontrolled uh, multinational growth to where they have undercut organized labor here by utilizing slave labor in other countries. 
And that not only undercuts the American worker and the American economy, but ultimately it undercuts those countries too, because eventually those people, as we're seeing right now in Korea and Taiwan and places, you know, those people who were working <coughs> at slave wages, they begin demanding uh, decent wages and so on. So that instead of the United States suppressing those things, those kinds of movements in other countries, we as a nation need on the one hand to make multinationals more responsible, not only to the American public and the American economy, but to the world economy and the world public. And we need to even those playing fields again, because eventually we're going to have to, whether it, it, we end up having to, to suppress rebellions in other countries uh, or here from our own people who have been thrown out of work. So, and, and one of the things that he has an amazing ability to do, again, is to tie those pieces together. To see how they're related. Make links right. that no other candidate makes. Mm -hmm. And it, it just makes for a whole different kind of approach to, 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 uh, to politics. Let's talk about the campaign and the Democrats. Uh, last time there were problems. Of course, the Democratic establishment didn't want any part of Jesse Jackson. And still... They're freaking out and trying to figure out ways to either shove him aside or uh, keep him out of the limelight some way, anything. How successful is this so far, and do you think they'll continue to do that? Well, well, has there been a change in some ways? I think in some ways there's been a change. I don't know mm -hmm. to what extent. It's, it's probably a uh, little bit on each side. Mm -hmm. been several things have happened, of mm -hmm. course. First, in, in 84, I think, to, to begin with that part of it, I think an awful lot of people, particularly in the Democratic establishment, were responding to their own myths about Jesse Jackson. They were still seeing the big afro and the dashikis and, you know, this and that. And in many ways, you know, he had been tagged as being radical, uh, uncontrollable, a loose cannon, unpredictable. You know, he's going to go off and form a third party. He's going to, you know, start cursing or whatever, right? And it was, in many ways, it was like they were responding to those stereotypes whether anything in his behavior, right, substantiated that view or not, didn't make any difference. They just knew that's the way he was, right? So in many ways, that's the way they reacted to him. Um, and so we were very much uh, on the fringes as, as, as the way that they dealt with us. I think several things have happened that have changed that to some extent, although it, does, it still is happening to some extent. First, of all the candidates, uh, in fact, of all major Democratic Party leadership nationally. Jesse was the only one who towed the line after the 84 election. Even people like Ted Kennedy were saying the Democratic Party has to become more uh, conservative. It has to become more like Ronald Reagan because look at the landslide victory of Ronald Reagan in 84. It demonstrates that the Democratic Party is no longer in touch with the American public. And Jesse was saying, not true. That was a personal victory for Ronald Reagan because of his personal popularity. It was not a political victory for Ronald Reagan. It was not a victory for his philosophy, for his, his views of, of government and, and where we should be going. Um, and so he told the line on that. He said, you know, the Democratic Party has to stay with its historic principles, with its, with, it, with its historic constituencies. We have to stop running from the special interest and this and that that we had been kind of tagged with. And I think that has come to pass. I think, you know, we have seen that in fact it was basically a personal victory for Ronald Reagan and not a, a victory for the Republican Party or for, for Ronald Reagan's vision of the world. Uh, in fact, on, I, mean, I think, I think uh, aid to the Congress is a good example. I mean, throughout his term, two-thirds to three-fourths of the American public has consistently opposed aid to the Contras. And so, so even though they were voting for him, they still did not support his right. basic vision of the world. Um, so I think that some of that, that reality has set in. I think also certain circumstances have, have, have uh, uh, quote-unquote, helped. One, of course, the thing with Gary Hart. I mean, here was someone who was considered to be kind of, at the time, when he was first in the race, as kind of, you know, the heir apparent to the Democratic Party leadership and so on and so forth. Then what he went through made him, I mean, he was off somewhere and nobody knew what the heck he was doing. Uh, they found out. They yeah, found they sure out. did, didn't they? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, what happened with Joe Biden, the same kind of mm -hmm. thing. And even with Albert Gore, you know, one of the things is very interesting. One of the things the Democratic Party did that we were not particularly pleased with, but we were willing to go along with it, the Democratic Party, Paul Kirk, um, made all of the candidates pledge to refrain from criticizing the other candidates, uh, to refrain from getting involved in these kind of personal, you know, differences uh, and just focus on the issues. And everybody agreed to that. The one who has, who has not lived up to that, to that promise is Albert Gore. He has begun to attack the other candidates um, and to attack them from the perspective of the Republican Party. <laughs> you know, mark my words, in the general election in November, Gore is going to be the person 
that the, Repub that the Republicans are quoting. Um, because he again is talking about special interests, he's talking about how the Democratic Party needs to become more conservative and so on and so forth. Uh, so, and the point that I'm making is that those kinds of events have also helped to demonstrate to the Democratic Party that Jesse really is uh, a team player, really is uh, in the mainstream, the historic mainstream of the Democratic Party. And that he's on track on the issues. It, absolutely. That he kept to the proper road rail. Exactly. But still, you hear, you read about how the Democratic establishment says that uh, 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 Jesse's uh, candidacy is, quote, divisive. You see that in the press a right. lot. Right. And that they're trying to do everything they can to, to uh, make sure that he doesn't go, get any further than he really does. And they're freaking out <coughs> within the councils of the fat cats. The oh, no question. Cats. No question that there are elements within the Democratic Party. Um, that are very disturbed by, by Jesse's standing in, in the polls, and particularly because uh, of the persistence of his standing in the polls. I think part of what we have seen here in Texas, for example, uh, has been that uh, the Democratic Party establishment here, the old guard, uh, has begun to rally around Albert Gore simply yeah. because he's, of course, the Southern candidate. And the whole DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, which is, of course, more conservative Southern uh, Democrats, uh, because I think part of what you saw happen was that after Hart dropped out of the race um, last year, the idea was that the, 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 the jump that Jesse took in the polls, where he began leading every, everybody uh, by huge amounts, that it was a temporary blip, you know, name recognition. Um, and they all expected it to kind of fade out fairly quickly. Well, I mean, his standing has stayed very high and, in fact, has increased in almost all instances. And it's been just a very consistent uh, support, and not and and it's a support that's not only among blacks, but among uh, a whole range of people. You know, we have consistently been in double digits in Iowa. Well, I mean, Iowa's one percent uh, black, so you can't argue that it's you know just black right. support. Here in Texas, there have been polls that have showed us with 58% uh, support among Hispanics, for example. So it's clear that it's a support that is much more broad-based than they had given us credit for in the past. So I think you're, you're, you're right in the sense that there are still elements within the Democratic Party. Um, and in many instances, I think, I think they are really behind the American public. We have found that there's an awful lot of Americans uh, from all kinds of backgrounds who are very, very much attracted to, to uh, what Jesse is saying, whether it's farmers in Iowa or in West Texas. We have had people from all kinds of backgrounds coming up to us and, and offering their support for the campaign. I mean, ha as someone who worked in the 84 campaign, I, can, I mean, I can swear to you that the support that we are getting among non-blacks this time is qualitatively and quantitatively different from, it was, uh, from what it was in, in 84. And so yet, I think some of those elements are disturbed by that. And yet in 84, Jesse couldn't get the support of the, quote, black establishment. Yes, that's true. And again, it, it, now, it, it was... What is that start out with, and then has it changed at all this time? You mean, what is the support? No, what is the black establishment? I hear from well, people talk about that. Is it the Southern le leadership? Uh, not only. You're really yeah. talking about... Um, there is, there is a, a broad base of... of oh, I don't want to say broad base, but there is a, a cross-section of uh, the black community, particularly elected officials, um, Congress people, mayors throughout the country, uh, as well as some leadership of like the NAACP and a few other organizations, the uh, National Urban League and so on, that uh, generally speaking are identified as the leadership of the black community in the United States. Um, and what happened in 84, of course, was for a whole series of reasons. Uh, one, of course, was Jesse got into the race somewhat late. Others because they simply had a difficult time dealing with, 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 with Jesse. And others because, of course, like all of us, have egos and there's... there's they were rival competing for leadership. Yeah, there's rivalry for leadership right. of the black community and so on and so forth. Um, and most of them supported Mondale, supported Hart. We had very little support among, among those people. Um, and what happened was that in every instance, without fail, every single instance, whether you're talking about uh, at the congressional level, or whether you're talking about Atlanta with uh, Andy Young, or you're talking about uh, Coleman Young, or Wilson Good in Philadelphia, or Tom Bradley in, in Los Angeles. In every single instance, we won those cities, those congressional districts, where those black leaders were not, were not supporting us. 
I mean, it was an amazing revelation, mm -hmm. I think, as much to white leadership in America as it was to those blacks. I mean, they really thought they controlled their constituencies. And really what it was was that you had this layer of leadership, but then you had the community down there. What we did basically as a campaign is we bypassed that leadership and went directly to the community through the black churches, through the black community leaders, black community organizations, and so on. And we were able to mobilize those communities to support Jesse. And so that, uh, of course, so as like I said, it was an amazing revelation to him. So now, in now, virtually all those people are supporting us. Oh, they are. Virtually every one of 19 out of the 23 uh, black uh, m members of the Black Congressional Caucus, for example, are supporting the campaign. Um, uh, most of the mayors are supporting the campaign. Uh, you know, and leadership again throughout the country is where, I mean, there's a few places where it's not, where you've had, for a whole series of historical reasons, Andy Young in Atlanta, for example, mm -hmm. uh, where, where they're not supporting us, but it's, it, they're very few and far between. Well, he's been an establishment man for a long time, a member of the Trilateral Commission and all this stuff, right? right in with Mondale and all. Right, and, well, go ahead. Just... I was just going to ask you about your evaluation of the media coverage of Jackson. Uh, it always amazed me to see him so high in the polls, and yet the media frequently would just ignore him. Right. In fact, I just this morning read through the New York Times for the entire week, and there was a story on all the other Democratic candidates on the Iowa caucus primaries that are coming up, and several on Hart, but nothing on Jackson. Mm -hmm. So here's some mainstream media just trying to uh, block him out, whereas he is one of the most popular uh, candidates. And this has been going on for months. Oh, no question. No what, question. What, what's happening? Why? How do you explain this? Well, um, you know, I, it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I, I have seen it in the last campaign. Uh, it's gone from negative uh, reporting and the negative reporting not sticking, whether it's trying to, you know, to argue that uh, with Operation Push that somehow, you know, it was in debt and that it didn't, it was not managed well, et cetera, et cetera, to reporting that we had $14,000 penalty on, on the, the 84 campaign in, in violations and so on, not reporting, of course, that Mondale has something like $3 million in violations. Um, to the negative reporting to just simply the, the ignoring of, right. uh, uh, of Jesse. You know, I don't know. I think the, the, the media, by and large, still has a very difficult time. And what we have to understand about the American media, again, making a generalization, is that it is, and I don't want to use the term necessarily racist, because I don't, you know, I mean, there's, there's elements of that. But I think the, the, more, the more appropriate term is insensitive. That is, I think it is insensitive not only to blacks, it's insensitive because there are very few blacks in management positions, there are very few blacks as reporters and so on. But it's also insensitive to uh, Hispanics, it's insensitive to women, it's insensitive to the elderly, uh, it's insensitive to union, to labor people, uh, insensitive to you know, progressive politics generally. Um, I mean, you find no one who uh, syndicated columnists nationally who I think you can really say is, is you know, quote unquote, far left, the way you find people far right. right. I mean, there is no left equivalent of, of George Will or William Buckley. Um, so that kind of insensitivity, I think, uh, you know, leads to a certain degree of either, either negative reporting or simply uh, ignoring of the campaign. And then, of course, they box themselves into a particular point of view, because once you come to believe that Jesse Jackson is unelectable, well, and it's, you know, what's the point of covering it? Right. I mean, that or not a anyway. serious candidate. Right, not a serious that. candidate. <laughs> uh, so what's the point of covering it? So I think, you know, it's just part of that whole kind of mentality that feeds off of, uh, off of itself and leads to, to either negative coverage or no coverage. Well, be, it will be interesting to see if the media are forced to give Jackson more coverage once the primary results start uh, coming in. Do you want to give your prognosis of what might be coming fourth in the election, what role you think Jackson will play? Well, I mean, I'm honestly very optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen this uh, Jesse Jackson uh, evolve over the last three or four years. I've seen the American public, I think, in some very significant ways evolve. Um, I think that, that we're going to do quite well. I think you'll see Jesse get uh, double digits in, in, in Iowa and New Hampshire. I think we'll take the South. Um, and I think after we take the South, I think you're going to see us take a lot of other areas, too. I think we're going to take New York, for example. One of the un, 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 unanalyzed pieces of this campaign is, is that uh, we're going to take New York. You know, we have uh, developed a coalition there. We've gotten all the endorsements of blacks as well as the Puerto Rican officials there and progressive whites, some of the labor unions. And we're going to get 30, 35 percent of the vote in New York and take it. That's why Cuomo can't get in the race. That's why he can't endorse anybody else uh, because he'll lose. He can't deliver his state for himself or for any other candidate. Uh, we'll do quite well in California. 
New Jersey, some of the Illinois. <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to take the election. I think the worst case scenario mm -hmm. is that we're going to walk into Atlanta with anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 delegates without anybody having a, a majority that they need. And therefore, if we are not the, the, the candidate uh, of the party, we'll be able to determine who that candidate is, who the vice president is, and a whole series of appointments. Well, the convention is still stacked uh, with a, a lot of power and extra votes given to the old boy club anyway, right? Yeah, very much so. No matter it? what you do. <clears throat> yeah, under, under most of the, of, the, of the way the rules operate, about 25% of the delegates are, are what they call super delegates, or kind of set aside so the popular vote doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. But we're, we're, we're combating that in a couple of ways. Number one, we just see ourselves as getting, of course, a, a, a significant percentage of the vote generally. So even of the 75% that is allocated on the basis of, of your vote, in, in your, your popular vote, we'll get a significant percentage of that. But we also, this time, our people are much more sophisticated, much more knowledgeable of, of delegate selection rules and convention processes. We're holding workshops all over the country on, on those processes. And we're, expending to, we're expecting to, to, to send our people to, the, to their, their precinct caucuses, their district caucuses, the state caucuses, and etc., knowledgeable of the rules and ready to do all that they have to do to get some of that 25% as well. So we think we're going to do very, you know, quite well. I think people are going to be surprised at how well we do uh, in, 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 in getting delegates. How does it, how you go about running a campaign with very little money? You have the least of anybody. You have to be very creative, right? As Jesse likes to say, we're a poor campaign. You can't even buy votes message. like everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, no, but in many ways it does. It forces us to be much more creative. It forces us to, um, you know, to, to be much more inventive in the kind of things that we do. But I think most importantly is simply that ours is a grassroots campaign. You know, um, what a lot of the other candidates do is they go out and they buy endorsements. They go out and they pay for people to go to conventions so that they can they buy their memberships in organizations, they buy their registration fees at conventions so that they can do, vote in the straw polls. Well, we, we can't do that. Uh, and I'm, in, in many ways, I'm glad we can't do that. But our, our support is at, a, is at the popular level. It's at, at, at the masses of people, people who have been disaffected in the past, people who have been disillusioned by the process, uh, people who have felt kind of on the margins of, of, of the political process. And they are the ones that, that Jesse is able to mobilize. He can, he can animate them. He can, he can create enthusiasm among them the way no other candidate in, in my lifetime has been able to do. And, I, and, and that really is where our base of support comes from. And that's a, that's, that's a base that you don't need a lot of money. Plus, we, we don't have the name recognition problem some of the other candidates have. We don't have to go out and buy name recognition. Jesse got it the old-fashioned way. He earned it with hard work. I mean, his name is not because he was born Kennedy or Rockefeller. Uh, you know, his name is because people know for the last 25, 30 years of his life, he has been in the forefront of the most significant change in this country whether it's in civil rights or whether it's in women's rights, whether it's in, you know, Vietnam, uh, foreign policy, he has been at the forefront of that kind of, and he's, and, and he's not afraid to face those issues. You know, I, as a case in point, last April 25th, 250,000 peace activists marched in Washington. No other candidate would show up. They were all invited. Uh, September 15th of 1987, the Teamsters who were being threatened with trusteeship by the government, um, no other candidate would show up except Jesse to speak to them. October the 11th of 1987, 750,000 gays and lesbians marched on Washington about the AIDS crisis. All of the presidential candidates were invited. Only Jesse showed up. Only Jesse was willing to be there and stand in front of 2,000 people dying of AIDS. The other candidates wouldn't, be, wouldn't, 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 wouldn't get close to it because it was not presidential. And that kind of courage, that kind of integrity, that kind of moral leadership, that kind of character uh, speaks for itself. And I think it it creates a certain kind of, uh, of enthusiasm and uh, an authentic kind of support that the other candidates, you know, cannot, cannot duplicate. When the top 40% of our society gets 16% of the income, making more and working less, the bottom 40% gets 15% working more and making less. The halves get a tax cut. The have not get a wage cut and give a concession. And 50,000 corporations make a profit and pay no taxes. That's un-American. That's immoral. Million more people in poverty 
while Wall Street goes out the roof. The poor find no bother in the safe net. There are now 41 million people in poverty. 29 million are white. The poor are mostly white and female and young. Most poor folks are not on welfare. They work every day. They drive cabs. They change beds in hotels. They mop halls in hospitals. They farm. They used to work at home mail. They're hard working people. <laughs> Mr. Reagan has been a master at taking people's eyes off the prize. Many of you needed jobs and security and health standards. Reagan gave you a prayer call for the flag. Now you got the prayer call and the flag, but you don't have your job. You don't have a minimum wage. You don't have justice. The workers in this nation, workers somewhere, sometimes, someplace, must stand up and say enough is enough. Today, people are coming together who never come together before. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor, but they labor in vain. It says there will be no peace in the valley until the lion and the lamb lie down together. There will be no peace on earth. Until we love each other and respect each other and dry each other's tears and share shoulders. We stand together today as God's people fighting for justice and freedom. We reject Rambo. We're fighting for Rambo. We want freedom in our That's Alternative Views for this time. We thank you for sharing your time with us. We'd also like to thank the people, Local P9 of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, who were struggling against the Hormel Company up in Austin, Minnesota. They made a copy of the Jesse Jackson tape for us and made it available to us so we could show it to you. And, of course, as usual, we want to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. We'll leave this on long enough for you to jot that down, Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.